Accessibility relates to making your website such that people can access it despite various disabilities that they may have. And accessibility um, comes from two different things. Number one is assistive technologies. And for our purposes, we consider assistive technologies anything, any hardware or software or any combination of the two that work together to allow a person with a disability to access the site. So the one that we looked at last time was a screen narrator that actually reads the stuff on the screen for you. All right. And that helps people navigate um, throughout the site. Um, other examples, there are on-screen keyboards. So like if you are not able to type, you may only have limited motion, but you can move the mouse and click. And this is something that's built right in the windows. So if we go and look. Always scan this section. The screen uh, reader must still be on. There's the screen reader. Initialize setup high contrast tool to location bar desktop backslash all controlled panel items backslash start narrator button. So it's narrating the setup screen high for contrast. You. Locate control panel home hyperlink icon hyperlink change administrative settings hyperlink vertical scroll bar at I don't zero know why it's on after help I shut hyperlink it down. we'll turn the sound down um, there are there's a screen magnifier that allows you to magnify the screen there is a on screen keyboard that allows you to type using the uh, a keyboard on screen as opposed to um, the, the actual physical keyboard. You can set up high contrast and that can help you if you have trouble with vision, uh, perhaps not complete blindness but poor eyesight or color blindness. Um, explore all settings, being able to use the computer without a mouse or a keyboard. And it talks about using the on-screen keyboard, making the mouse easier to use, and so on. All right. So there's a whole set of these assistive technologies that can be used. Um, unfortunately, assistive technologies, if you are not careful with the design, um, assistive technologies won't be any help at all. It would be like, again, a person could have a wheelchair to physically make, around, make their way around campus, but if you didn't have any wheelchair ramps or you didn't have elevators or something like that, uh, then um, the assistive technology wouldn't really be that much benefit uh, for someone getting around the, the um, uh, campus. Same thing here. Um, a screen reader will do a great job narrating the screen and people can navigate their way through the web, but you can easily make it difficult. You can easily make it difficult. Hmm. <laughs> that's actually that's a true statement. Yeah, I was going to say it, it sounded funny when I said it, but yeah, it, it's possible to make it difficult, and it's not hard to do for someone with a screen reader. For example, if you had all your links labeled click here, if that was the only text in the link, click here to see page one, click here to see page two. Uh, oftentimes, people with the screen reader will use a tab key to tab through the links, and, and the, the text of the link is read. Well, if each link is click here, then that doesn't tell the person accessing the site through a screen reader what clicking there will get them. And therefore, by you not making reasonable accommodations and using the principles of universal design,
You can defeat their assistive technologies. Reasonable accommodations, again, is the thought that there's obviously nothing you can do to make it so that a person that is blind see your images. All right? You just can't do it. You know, you're not that good of a web developer to be able to do that. However, you can make some attempt to, to uh, accommodate people with those um, particular problems, whether they be vision or hearing or motion control issues or whatever. Generally speaking, universal design and reasonable accommodations comes into two different strategies. One of them is simplicity, clarity, and the other is multiple presentations. Simplicity, clarity is just as it sounds. All right, don't have a site that's cluttered. Um, use appropriate size fonts. Put space between things so that things are clear and they don't run together. Use clear language. Use clear, easy to read fonts. Use clear, easy to read um, colors. If you think about it, that makes sense for really anyone, not just people with disabilities. Very few people would say, I want to visit a site that's cluttered, where the navigation is unclear, and the fonts are hard to read. Right? I mean, so in some respects, the clarity, simplicity part of it is just good web design. All right? Now, the multiple presentations, funny thing about the multiple presentations is, in a way, that's the exact opposite of simplicity and clarity. Right? Now you're adding stuff to the page. Simplicity and clarity implies sort of weeding the page down to its essence and, and only have the critical, important things on the page. But when I talk about multiple presentations, I'm talking about adding stuff. In other words, if you have a picture of something, have some text that goes along with it. And that text can be in the alt text attribute, or that text can be in the description, I believe, attribute. Um, or text on the page. If you have an audio recording um, where someone that is deaf can't hear it, you could have a written transcript. So here we're adding stuff on the page to, to, to provide reasonable accommodations. And again, it's a continuum. Simplicity and complexity sort of go both ways, and your goal is to find the right spot for any given project that you're working on. Obviously, the ultimate in simplicity would have a, be, be a website that, I don't know, maybe had only a sentence or two on every page. All right? Well, that wouldn't really be particularly useful. All right? Um, on the other hand, if you tried to cram everything onto one page, that's not going to be useful either. So finding a balance between those two, finding a balance between keeping things clear and yet still providing multiple options of someone getting the content. That's the key to um, designing, um, using the principles of universal design. Now when I say universal design, I'm not sure I define that term. But universal design means designing both for people with and, and without disabilities. And I think we saw last time that when you consider certain disabilities, you know, a certain percentage of the population has them. But when you go a little further and think about it, there's a lot more people that either have milder forms of that disability or, at the very least, um, could benefit from the reasonable accommodations provided for people with disabilities. For example, someone that, that is deaf, all right? there's a certain percentage of the population is deaf. When you add to that people that just have a hard time hearing, all right, they're, they're not deaf, but, you know, they can't hear very well, all right. 
When you add to that people say that are in a public computer laboratory where the speakers aren't available to them and they don't have headphones, you know, like one of our labs, for example. If you didn't bring headphones, there's no speakers on your computer. How would you hear an, a, a, a video clip or an audio clip? You couldn't. Or someone that doesn't want to take the time to sit through a five-minute video but wants to look at it and scan the story to see what's of interest in it. So even people without any disabilities can benefit from these multiple presentations. And that is the notion of universal design. And even if it's something that really isn't going to benefit someone, like an alt attribute, if you're not using a screen reader, you won't even notice the alt attribute probably. At the very least, it doesn't get in the way. I mean, it's just it's a few words of text. It doesn't make your page really uh, download any slower. Um, it's like the Braille classroom number outside. Most people would just ignore it and not, not even realize it's there. Last right. time we talked about, I think, two disabilities, if I remember right. We talked about uh, people that are visually impaired and then other variations of that condition, that is people who don't see very well and people who are colorblind. I think we also talked about people with motor control issues, that is people that would may maybe have a hard time navigating a page using a mouse or typing. All right. And we talked about, you know, the use of big targets for the links, um, keyboard shortcuts and uh, things such as that um, to help people. Also not making them click a million links to find what they're looking for is also something you could do to benefit. Deafness, we didn't talk about last time, but we talked about it now. Multiple presentation would be to have a transcript of any audio that you have. So that if someone would um, access your site and they are not able to hear, then they could look at the uh, the, the transcript of it. And again, that could benefit someone that doesn't want to sit through the length of the video but simply wants to scan through the article or someone that's in the library and doesn't have the audio available and so on. There's a variety of different cognitive issues that people may have uh, or neurological issues, and we'll kind of lump all those together. Now, I, this isn't my area of expertise, um, but again, you should be at least somewhat aware of these as it relates to web design. And these include things such as ADHD, Dyslexia, other cognitive disabilities, and so on. What about ADHD? That stands for a, 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 a attention deficit hyperactive. Disorder, okay. I, I couldn't think of what the last D stood for. What does that mean? Could, pardon me? People like that typically have a, a lot of energy. That's probably true. How does that translate into being possibly a liability when you're surfing the web? They can't sit still, right. Uh, they, want it, they want it faster, which we all are sort of guilty of that, right? Um, and the other thing that we're probably all um, somewhat guilty of too is is we're easily distracted. All right. Um, what can you do design-wise to help out someone with those sorts of issues? Visually appealing, and how so? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Okay. Okay. Uh, you, you definitely would want to engage people with that. All right. Uh, whatever technique. Now, you mentioned things like having like uh, an animation or a graphic. Actually, I would say that that, and, and you sort of came to that same conclusion, that, that that probably wouldn't be a good idea because that would be a distraction. So, uh, the one thing I would say is this is where the clarity comes in. Have it stripped down, have it simple, so there's not a hundred things going on on the page at the same time. You know, what's the worst thing, uh, you know, w w the biggest time waster, and I don't have ADHD, but, you know, you go to YouTube to look at a video, and what do you end up doing? Looking on the side, seeing all the other videos that you could see, and clicking on those, and next thing you know, two hours has gone by, and you haven't gotten the stuff done that you need to. Well, they do that for a specific reason, but um, they provide a lot of distractions. Now, they want the, the distractions in that case. They want to keep you on their site. Um, but for a business, for an organization, that the providing distractions like that probably isn't the best thing. All right? So keep your page plain and stripped down and not distracting. One that I forgot about is epilepsy. All right. Yeah, for, for flashing, uh, for, for epilepsy, things such as certain animations can uh, trigger seizures. All right. So what would you do if you had an animation and you were concerned about that? Okay, it's paused and has a delay. Well, it, there's a way to do almost everything. So, yeah, there, there would be a way that they could turn it off. You could warn them. I don't know if you've ever been, like, to Cedar Point or other amusement parks or whatever. There'll be, like, a sign that will say, this ride has flashing lights, blah, blah, blah. You know, and that way you, you let them know. And then... Along with that, you might give them a way to get the content without experiencing the animation or, or whatever it is. All right? You definitely wouldn't just put a cutesy animation on your page just to have it then because, again, it doesn't add any value to it. So clarity would be um, something that you'd want to do um, for that. And again, uh, possibly have a, a text to replace an animation if you're concerned about the animation potentially triggering seizures. Again, it all comes back to those two things. Keep it simple, keep it stripped down, and provide multiple ways to get the same content um, is, is sort of the technique to, uh, to follow. What about dyslexia? What is, what is dyslexia? Because there are some misconceptions about dyslexia, but what is dyslexia? Yes. Right, right. Yeah, that, that, that's a good way uh, to say it. The, the, the letters, um, the, the letters um, become, you said, you used the phrase mumbled up. Um, they could be inverted. You could, for example, confuse a lowercase b for a lowercase d. Um, you could not be able to differentiate between maybe a y and a j. Um, in some cases, the sequence is. Let's see if we can find a resource that will show us what a person with dyslexia would see. Because I was just thinking that. I, I've never, never looked for one, but... Um, th right. I'm making sure I find one first before I, I do that. There's colorblind filters we saw last time that would be a way to do that. Um, regarding visually impaired, the person that I spoke with um, at NASA, the mentor of the, the blind uh, high school student, said, if you really want to test a page for accessibility, turn off the monitor and don't use the mouse. 
because that would be how they would navigate it. So have your screen reader going and navigate it that way. All right, here's a sort of a summary of that. Might see some letters as backwards or jumbled or, 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 or around. Um, she might see text appear to be jumping. She might not be able to tell the difference between letters, but, and so on. Here's an example of what someone with dyslexia would see. Another example of how they may see the word, someone with dyslexia might see the word teapot. All right. Now, the point is it isn't so simple. A lot of people um, think it's simply, re you know, people see the words backwards. So it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. And again, it, it's individual um, variations. And from what I understand, it's not like it would be 100% of the time. It could be sometimes or, or, or whatever. Sometimes be worse than others or, or so on. What can you do for someone with dyslexia? Let's keep in mind the, the, two, the two considerations that we had. Clarity and multiple presentations. What could we do for someone with dyslexia? Screen reader possibly would help. All right. Um, having a screen narrator would possibly help. So almost the same controls uh, or the same situation as someone who is blind. I actually didn't think of that, but that would be a good example. All right. Um, in, in which case, we wouldn't have to do anything. We would just have to make sure our design was such that it accommodated a screen reader. One other thing, by the way, uh, and this brings up an interesting point. Yeah, let's, let's, let's put that on hold for a second, because I, I did have a thought. What is better from an accessibility perspective? A link that is text that says home page, or a link that is a image with some crazy font that says home page. So what's better for links, text or images? Well, no, technically about it. Text is better. Why is text better? Straight to the point, and what advantages does that provide? Right. Someone that's blind can't see that. Now, you could have an alt, alt attribute on that, but that still would not be as clear as simply having the words. All right. Now, I've had people say, I want my links to look like buttons. All right. What do you do in that case? What if you want your, your links to look like buttons? Yeah, learn CSS, all right? Become an expert in CSS. 
So yeah, you want to, any answer to any question in web development that says, how do I make it look? You can just say CSS. You don't even need to hear the rest of the sentence, right? Because CSS is the way to go. Here's an example, and you can find many of them, but example of, this is purely a text link. Or a button, and, and you can't really see on the screen. I can see a little better on my screen. And when you put your mouse over it, it becomes a darker color. Yeah. All right, um, and there's a lot of other examples as well. C CSS button maker. You don't even need to learn CSS, all right? You just need to learn how to copy and paste, all right? So we could go and, you want a bigger button? You want a littler button? You want bigger font? You want littler font? You want more rounded, less rounded? What font do you want? There you go. And where do you get the code for it? <laughs> I don't see that. Oh, the button. The <laughs> view the CSS. So there you go. They give you a style for a button to do that. All right. The other advantage, by the way, and again, this is less of an issue now than it was you know, so many years ago, is that text is, even text, even with CSS, is still going to be smaller than the images that you're going to uh, force the people to download. All right? Um, and then you have the advantage of, if you want the buttons to look different, you don't have to go and recreate a whole mess of images. All right? So there's no reason at all to use a image just to accomplish a button. Even if there was a crazy design for a button that you wanted to have that was impossible to create with CSS and you had to use an image, what would you do? How would you handle it if you couldn't make a button with CSS and it had to be that way, but you still wanted it to be accessible? All right, simpler than that. Make the button image a background image and put text over top of it. All right. So if I wanted uh, the pizza to be a button, if I wanted a slice of pizza to be the button, there's no CSS for pizza appearance, right? You can make your background image to the button a slice of pizza, and then you could um, put just put text over top of it. So make all your links text is the bottom line. All right. Anyhow, back to dyslexia. David, you were saying something before we hit this uh, digression of, of, of things with... Uh okay. Absolutely. What is word spacing and line height? Okay, um, so for example, these are, these are typography terms and they, they go back to printing presses. That's why you hear leading, all right? You know, there's no lead in CSS, but there used to be lead in printing machines, right? So, word space, uh, what, what did you say, word? Uh, yeah. Word space would be the space between words. This is or versus this is. Alright. Um, let or line height would be, this would be a very close line height. This would be a bigger line height. 
They'll put spaces in between stuff. And there's even letter spacing that can help that out. So that would be something you could do. Um, color contrast, make sure you have a good color scheme for the letters, would certainly be that. Okay. 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 Uh, all right. Okay, a good, good question. Uh, the statement was made that, that Cher, the singer, has as dyslexia and puts a yellow piece of film over top a book and that, that helps her read. What could we do similar to that um, with dyslexia um, on our web pages? Okay, we could we could use we could use good color combinations. All right, so we could make the background page yellow. Now, and, and this is something I, I don't know because I'm not an expert about dyslexia, but. Would you would it be the you think it would be the same color for everyone? My guess would be probably not, because there's so many different forms. Right. So what could we do then? Okay. One possibility would see if there's something we could do that was the best. The other possibility would be provide some options. All right. Um, let's see. Sometimes this is called um, skinning a site. And here's an example. not found. I know my screen isn't up. Sometimes from clicking on sites, whereas I do not know where they are, I like not to have my screen on to avoid any unpleasant surprises. This one may have changed. That's one problem with
Okay, here's kind of an example. How you can take and, and you can create a wiki of your own. All right. Um, a wiki is a page like Wikipedia, where it can be uh, edited by the users of the site. And this particular service allows you to create your own wiki. So, for example, you can make a product manual that was a wiki that your customers could actually add to and edit. All right. Now, here's an example of the same kind presented different ways. So there is one way that it could look. Here is a manual for a fraternity. There's another way that it could look. There's another way. And so on. So, one thing that's always good from an accessibility and a design perspective is where you can give users a choice. This would also be benefit for people who are visually impaired, right? If you're colorblind, there are certain combinations of colors that work for you and certain combinations that don't work for you. What better thing to do than give someone the choice where they could pick um, what they see? And again, even people that don't have necessarily a, uh, um, a, a condition can um, pick the colors that is easier for them to read. Period. I mean, people have preferences. All right. Um, so giving users choice would be good in dyslexia as well. And that choice could include things like colors, like you mentioned, a, a yellow background works for share. All right. But it could also include the fonts itself, because certain fonts are more um, well suited to people who are dyslexic versus not. For example, some of the more elaborate decorative fonts, fonts that look like script or whatever, are typically harder for people with dyslexia to read. Um, again, we could do a quick Google search. Best fonts for dyslexia. And we can get some research. team of researchers in Spain published results with study to determine which fonts were easiest. They determined that reading performance was best with sans serif monospace and Roman fonts. Let's see. There's the full report. And they've summarized their findings here. There's some that are designed specifically for people with dyslexia. Now again, given the individual nature of this, just like the individual nature of colorblindness, giving options could be beneficial. Now, Again, even with giving options, you balance between clarity and multiple presentations. One thing I do not like about some software is when there's too many options. 
there's too many options that can be terribly confusing for you, all right, to sift through them and, and all that. And what is the result of that? Well, people just won't use the options. People will ignore that, all right? So web developers and, and technical people tend to like a lot of detail. I mean, that's probably why they went into the field to begin with, all right? However, users don't. Users just want to do their job. All right? Users just want to read their web pages and, and have it simple and understandable. So you have to be careful when you provide options not to do overkill. All right? And again, all these things are contradictory in a way. We want it to be clear, but we want to give multiple options and so on and so forth. That's the art of being a designer, is making the right choices so that you can accommodate everyone and all the goals with... Um, you know, uh, to the greatest degree as possible. Um, let's see. Trying to think what else we had here. ADHD, dyslexia, cognitive disabilities. Some of the cognitive disabilities would, uh, again, fall in the category of ADHD or dyslexia, and a lot of the techniques would be the same. As a last word on this, then there's age-related conditions, which is kind of like all of the above, right? Um, uh, I, I, you know, everyone in this class is younger than me, so I'll give you a preview of what you have to look forward to, all right, at least if you, if you follow the experience that I do. You're not going to go blind necessarily, but it'll be harder for you to see. You're not going to go deaf, but it's going to be harder for you to hear. You're not going to lose the ability to use your hands, but clicking on small areas of the screen will become harder, all right? So getting older is so a mild case of all these disabilities together. So one thing that you can, and you know, the things that you do for those disabilities also help people with age-related conditions. All right, now, three more topics this semester, and we will start them off on Wednesday, but um, a word first. The topics are forms, tables, and JavaScript. Providing options, for example, for CSS requires more than we have learned so far, by the way. However, if you do a good separation of the CSS and HTML and have all your styling in the CSS file, then you're in a position to where you can apply multiple CSS files and, and make your pages um, work with, with different uh, visual designs. Now, the, in addition to those three topics, the big thing for the rest of the semester is the design and, and finishing up your project. The design for the project is due this week, this Wednesday, if I believe. Um, oh, it's today. Okay. Uh, all right. So, um, by all means, um, get that done and turned in as quickly as possible. Um, if you do have questions and you can't get it quite turned in today, that's fine. All right? But make an effort to have it turned in by Wednesday um, or at the very, very least this week. It's important for me to look at that and give you feedback so that you're going on the right track for this. Uh, feel free to bring questions to class, either about the design or about the, the finished project. Does anyone have questions now about the project, either the design or the finished? With the, the prototype, yes. Yes. Uh, in other words, for for the prototype, the prototype by definition is something that isn't finished. So you don't have to have actual content. You will on your final version of the project, but for your prototype, it's okay to have fake content, the Greek text, or, or whatever. The idea of the prototype is that um, a picture, as they say, is worth a thousand words. You can describe what your site's going to look like all you want, but 
when you actually get it in front of someone, they can look at it and say, I like this, I don't like that. One thing that's important to, to recognize is you kind of have to develop a little bit of a thick skin when you create prototypes because a lot of times prototypes are used uh, and people criticize them. Not in a mean way, but in a way to say, well, I like this, but I think this should be moved over there and I think this color should be darker and whatever. It's very hard for people to imagine things when you have a blank slate. In other words, here's a blank sheet of paper, show me what you want the page to look like. Most people will be very intimidated by that, most users, non-graphic designers. That's where you come in and you take your best shot at designing what you think is going to be good. Once you present something like that to someone, they can always tell you how they would change it and how to make it better. All right? And again, you know, you can kind of laugh at it and say that's human nature. It's hard to come up with original ideas, but it's easy to criticize other people's work, right? But that's the reality of the situation. And it's not because there's anything wrong with the users, but they don't, that's not in their skill sets necessarily. So sometimes you present a prototype with the thought that it might be criticized and torn apart, but if it is, that's not a bad thing because you're getting the answers that you need, all right? And you're getting a description on, on, on how they do want it to work. So a prototype should be complete enough to give someone an idea of what the finished site's going to look like and how you're going to navigate through it. But you don't want to spend time making a perfect prototype because that's the finished product and you don't want to do the whole finished product until you're pretty sure of the direction that you want to go to on it. Other questions? All right. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. The, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I. I. I use the phrase word document the way that a user would use it, just some document. Uh, a PDF file is fine. Um, it doesn't have to be Word. Uh, Word is a tool that most people, I assume, would be familiar with, but if you can make PDFs, more power to you. Other questions? The prototype now should be actually HTML and CSS code, though. Other questions? Comments? All right, let's go to lab.